fight comes in. Oh, he's oh. going for the Megadar. The triple stun. Here's the follow through. It's going to be two already. And into the back line goes Let Me Cannot Kill Up. Both those. The Chinese members are calling left and right. Uzi on the run. He's not here to follow soon. This could be the death now. Uzi trying to kite from Uzi. Oh. Legend of SK Telecom will not die today. SKT, masters of control, will take down the Nexus, will take down RNG, and are headed to their fourth World Championship final. Welcome everyone to the Shanghai Oriental Sports Stadium where I am joined for Worlds tonight by Kobe and by Frosker. And after what was another super, super exciting day, we got five days, uh, five days, five games again. Although I can imagine that Frosk right now, you're not feeling too happy about the LPL's team final performance. Well, I got just five incredible games. Yeah. That definitely hurt, but now I'm going to pretend that it's totally fine. <laughs> well, let's take a look at what we uh, had on the plate or on the score today in the bracket. SK Telecom T1 was going up against RNG, and it was the story of the dynasty of SKT up versus RNG and Uzi. But in the end, it was SKT that reigned supreme. Kobe, that dynasty, it is still going. Elimination games, no problem at all. They beat yeah. them all. I mean, I got to say, I'm just exhausted <laughs> after that series because everyone heading into it was already on the edge of their seat. Is it time? Is it time? Is SKT dynasty over? Are they going to, you know, is this going to be it? They were pushed so far in quarterfinals. Uh, and for every single game of that series, you still felt that way. You're like, is this it? Is RNG going to do mm -hmm. it? They go up 2-1, and SKT come back. They stand tall once again and make their way to the final, silencing critics again. Yeah, I do think there's maybe some differences with uh, that quarterfinal match in that I feel like there was a clear point where you saw SKT taking over, and on the other hand, where you saw RNG kind of falling down. But let's take it game by game and start Frost by looking at that game one where RNG came in swinging and played the way you want to see them play, right? And have all the things going for them. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of been this new iteration of RNG where they are playing more of that kind of a late game scaling oriented type of play where it's a little bit calmer and, and then it rocks up and then game one, they're like, no, nope, throw that out the window. We're going to skirmish all the time. We're going to fight all the time. And Emma, like, she really showed up big on the first half of this series. His Sejuani play was incredible. I just wish that he had gotten that champion all the way through. Yeah, uh, maybe wish that he didn't take the Nocturne uh, <laughs> in one of those games as well, because that was We try to flop. forget. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that's always the question then. Uh, the draft and the picks and bans, I think, as we're still looking at images of game one, or maybe not. It starts to tilt, but SKT does go down in that series and does go down to elimination point. Enter Peanut. This time it is uh, the world on its head. Blank starts and Peanut turns around. So how much are we accrediting to Peanut in that game four? And how much are we accrediting to maybe things that RNG fails to do later? I mean, there's there's a, a lot of parts to that question. So we'll start with the first one. There's uh, the ingenious component of subbing out the jungler. It's like if you're going to have a, a sub standing behind where you're playing a six-man roster, the jungle seems like the greatest position to do it because it seems to be that most uh, heavy, like, Tracking mine hunter uh, macro. Mind hunter. Mind That's hunter what I'm going to call myself from now on. I'm a mine hunter. Yes. What role do you main? Mind hunter. <laughs> and so you get to sit there, you get to download. And that was always the, the reputation that Blink had. You know, he was the closer. He downloads his opponent, he comes in, he has them all figured out. Uh, but when you reverse that role and, and suddenly you're just changing up these uh, dramatic styles, and Peanut has been kind of you know, almost force-fed into this grinder where he's been then smashed into a, a Bengi mold. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not the Peanut Rocks Tigers that we wanted to see. And then he comes up swinging in game four and five. He's like, level two gank bottom on Jarvan. Let's do it. And he was also given Jarvan and Galio in that final draft. Yeah, I mean, the, the Junglers is such a cool story and, and a really important story for this series. Um, also because while you're talking about game number four is the game that he subbed in, it wasn't like... Peanut really like broke out of his shell, I guess, until game number five. Like game number four was still another look at Peanut in that mold of okay, I'm gonna play the guy, the the Gragas, you know, the next tank down the tier list, uh, and he kind of does what's necessary for SKT to to stabilize basically. But then game number five really was about some critical moments from him making big plays. And Azale made a great point. Uh, I think it was on social media where he talked about you know. 
Can you imagine being given that opportunity? You have this incredible dynasty like SKT. They are literally sitting on the brink of destruction, and Peanut finally gets subbed into a position that he hasn't been, and then he's given you know these tools like Gragas, like Jarvan, and he gets to make his reputation that he's going to be the guy that saves the dynasty, that carries them into the bird's nest. And that was Bangi last time. And the Bangi story is probably the only guy who can relate to him because then that one... You know, Koma forgets about, uh, you know, Nidalee or whatever the you know stories are coming out. And then they're like, oh, Bengi, yes, you know, this champion that you're known for not performing that well on. Go ahead and take that and, and, sa <laughs> and save the dynasty as well. So, like, SKT junglers and, and what she talks about with subbing in that position has just always been so important for the uh, for this team. Definitely has. And I talked to Peanut afterwards and I said, hey, at MSI, it was all the Peanut show. Uh, what's your confidence like now? And he said he would take so, so much from these two games and being able to really put his mark on this game and carrying them to the bird's nest, as you say, going into that final. And we also have to look across the board. Faker did do fantastically well in the other quarter final. He did well here. Uh, the bottom lane, though, had a really good... Good gaming game four, I would say, but overall, what is your impression? Have they redeemed themselves enough for you guys? I'm gonna hit that with a soft no mm -hmm. for me on Bang and Wolf. Um, I think Bang has gotten a little bit more solid, although it's hard to say just because the ADC is given so many resources in this meta. Uh, but Wolf is still very hit and miss for me. There's a lot of these uh, trades where he just is standing on the wrong side of the lane or he's taking the wrong trade pattern. He loses a lot of his health. It didn't help that Huni was also kind of misusing his teleports at the uh, front half of that series. And then because Huni doesn't have teleport and Let Me does, suddenly Bang and Wolf can't do anything in the lane. That has nothing to do with their individual performances. But it still wasn't the shining light that we're used to seeing. I mean, there wasn't too long ago that we were crediting Bang and Wolf with so much bringing to this team, and that seems to have passed. Yeah, it honestly feels like SKT right now are kind of limping through this world championship, and the limp is in the bottom lane. Uh, honestly, like the last game they were talking about, we've got Huni on top side making huge plays for the team. Peanut stepping up. Faker has been consistently at his god tier level for the entire tournament. <laughs> it's like, like he's running around trying to take care of all of his little kids who keep bumping into hot stoves and <laughs> sc scraping their knees and stuff on this Galio for five games. He's like, child gates you know, everywhere. I'll save you now. Uh, but the bottom line, I feel like, was, is the consistent worry for this team. And I think that's still going to be the case heading into the finals. So a lot of eyes are still going to be there regardless of which opponent they get. And it's the fact that they've completely moved away from the Ardent Sensor meta. Yeah, they played it a couple of times in this series, but they weren't building Ardent Sensor supports. They were trying to put all of their resources into Huni. He's the big split push. So, like, SKT, when you're struggling that hard, when Faker is playing that well, something has to be going terribly wrong because it should be a breeze for how incredible Faker has been this tournament. That's a great point. Before we move on, I do want to turn it on the side of RNG and Uzi specifically in that bottom lane, right? Because this does keep happening as you alluded to before we uh, started here so what is kind of your final take on rng today frost it, it's so hard to approach this conversation because it's 100 percent speculation but the thing is is i've watched uzi for pretty much all of his career and, I, and i've seen him get to these points and then just kind of fall over but what i really want to put a magnifying glass on for viewers is Uzi's specific performance and choices that he makes in game five. Like when it comes to that big clutch moment, when you expect Uzi to be the God, to showcase that mechanical ability and be that legacy that we know he's capable, he doesn't do it. He takes a step back. Uh, you look to the LPL finals, I believe he played Ash in game five, and there were atrocious Ash ults and atrocious flashes. You look at this game, he just kind of disappeared. It, it was MLXG that, yes, got caught out on the Baron, but it was MLXG that was trying to make the play. It was Xiaohu who stepped up and tried to steal the Baron. And so at some point, I do have to question if Uzi has the heart in game five, that he's going to step up, step up and be that veteran and say, I'm gonna make the crazy play. Like, pick, pick Vayne in game five. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm like, do we want our AD carry making the big play? But honestly, even though it's it's such a team game, there are so many things that we don't we can't we can't have knowledge to of what's going on inside this team. It's happened so often that you have to start to even think like, has, has he created his own mental block of a self fulfilling prophecy or something, or mm -hmm. how long is this cycle really going to continue? Because the stats that you guys are throwing out at the beginning of the day are incredibly damning. It's like, what is it, 11 now? Like, he, it's it's ridiculous at this point. That's, yeah. a, that's yeah, what yeah. we're ending on. 
And, and it, it's not just Uzi either. I mean, Clear Love kind of suffers of the, under the same curse. Uh, the Chinese fan base is massive, and the amount of heat and pressure that these players under the spotlight is intense. Clear Love believes that he was cursed for quarterfinals. Broke it because he didn't make it out of groups. But Uzi <laughs> thinks he's cursed to never win a championship. And mm -hmm. at some point, that tiny voice in the back of your head, that is going to create a mental block. Yeah, it will, and it is up to him to overcome it. And it didn't work today. And that also means you talk about the huge Chinese community and the LPL fans. It is all on the shoulders of teams. WE tomorrow up versus Samsung to get to the final and get an LPL team in the bird's nest. So, Kobe, what are our first thoughts about that semifinal? Good luck, Mystic, because <laughs> Team WE put a lot of uh, you know effort into that bottom lane, and that's where they're going to have to perform. Other than that, I would also be excited to see a rematch of SK Telecom versus Samsung Galaxy with the journeys of those two teams. And... They're not, you know, these these two perfect teams, right? They've had to struggle and they've really had to work for it this year. So I think both of those would be actually pretty interesting matchups. Yeah, the the evolution of both of the Korean Titans clashing, I think, would be incredible. It also would be what the first team to make a repeat uh, appearance in a world's final with the exact same roster. That's a huge accomplishment for Samsung. Yeah, it is. We'll see what happens today. I don't think you guys are very confident that it will go as close as it was today with the five games, but everything has been an upset. So what do you think, Fra? I mean, how often can we say, ah, there's no way it'll be a five-game series this time Feels around. like you want to say it again, but... It, it, it yeah. Probably. My personal opinion, I know that I view it much closer because I, I view Team WE a lot higher than uh, the other analysts at the tournament. I still believe strongly that Team WE were always the strongest LPL team, uh, and, and hopefully they get to prove that tomorrow because they're the last one left standing. They are the last LPL team left standing going up against Samsung tomorrow, so that'll do it for us for tonight after our first semi-final we'll see you back here tomorrow for more action and Royal never give up, taking to the stage for our first semi-final. We were here just a year ago to watch these teams do battle. They get this boat, here comes the chase, lands the kill! Oh, look at the Chinese crowd go wild! Block, the spike, the ulti from Ming! That's gonna secure no flashes in! Championship Finals!